there is this phrase, the more you study something, the more <laughs> you realize that you don't know anything. Hey, well, what do you want to do? You know, the sky's the limit. Try it. Yeah, I can do it. Why not? It's like a practice. I'm becoming better at it. Do you want to have a neurosurgeon who has never looked at an actual body and has only looked at a computer to try to figure out what's going on? We, we figured out how to make things work. Cheated a little with a little modern method. Contraception is not the same as abortion. They started testing on people. How is that? Oh my God, oh my God, I never, I never understood that. Welcome to our podcast. And today we have a wonderful guest, guest Dr. Jane Meinstein. And um, she is a professor of biology here at Arizona State University. And you're also director uh, for the Center of Biology and Society at Arizona State University. And what's, what's your favorite thing about your career here at ACU? Well, well, I have a really long career, so <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of things. I think that the most exciting thing about ASU that we have to say in the current language is innovation and, and inclusion, but that ever since I came in 1981, it's been true that ASU is a place that lets you do things. And so I went to more traditional schools as undergrad and grad um, student. And when I came to ASU, it was really well, what do you want to do? You know, the sky's the limit. Try it. Experiment. And it, was, it didn't feel as constrained. It didn't feel like people were telling me, no, you can't do that. People were saying, yeah, if you want to do it, let's try it. And when Michael Crow came 20 years ago, it became even more so. Let's try things. Let's see what we can do, which is why we have biology and society, something called that. We're pretty much the only program like that in the country. Um, Cornell has an undergrad program, but we have this sort of expansive biology and society, and it's part of the life sciences. So it's like uh, here you have more chances to fail, to experience things that don't work, to make it work. Yes, that's really well put. And you remind me of my father, who was a nuclear physicist. And my father used to say, yeah, you got to keep trying, and sometimes you have to fail. And there's one time when I said, I, I was being a little smug, and I said, I've gotten every NSF grant that I applied for. And he said, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> You've got to fail to you know, kind of stretch your, your abilities and stretch what you want to do beyond what you're confident in, and that's totally right. Yes, I also feel it like that. But um, did you have many things in life that were like, oh, it doesn't work, but you kept trying, and then one day it was just like, okay, it works? Sometimes, yes. And sometimes the smartest thing is to know when to cut your losses. So in other words, some things won't work. I mean, if it's experimental, and if you're trying things experimentally, some should fail, as you said. And then knowing that, okay, it failed, let's try something else is really important. I think that's one problem with some areas of science, and especially you guys, you know, you're a grad student. I mean, when you're a grad student, you're in a certain slot, you're supposed to do certain things, and then if it looks like it's failing, okay, I just spent three years, and now I'm going to admit that that failed and start over? Yuck. You know, so there's high pressure not to admit that something failed. Um, but we should, and then figure out, all right, then how do you pursue a path that is more productive? Or how do you learn from what didn't work to figure out you know, how to fix it? Yeah, sometimes it's very important to admit your mistake, right? Yeah, like it happened to me a week ago when I cut off the car, some like other car in the other lane, I cut it off, like, and I immediately realized it. And usually it sounds like some people just drive away from this situation. But then I stopped on the stoplight and I just, I like rolled my window down and I talked to the person. I was like, I'm so sorry this happened. And I felt like kind of bad, but but kind of good. Cause like I admitted my mistake and that means I'm not gonna repeat it. That's great. <laughs> That's a great example. Yeah, kind of, it fits in a category of kind of strategies for success. So even when something looks like it was a bad thing or 
you know, bad situation, you try to turn it into a positive and turn it into something that is successful and everybody learns from. It's like there is a phrase, um, there is nothing wrong happening in your life. In your life, if, if it's good, then you get, you know, benefits from it. If it's bad, you learn from it, you get a lesson. So I feel like it's something like this. Yeah. Um, how about experiments? How, what type of experiments have you performed in your life? Uh, in biology, in maybe, and more broadly in medicinal studies as well? Yeah, well, so my field is more, my emphasis is more history and philosophy of science and looking at policy and things like that. So it's not what we call experiments typically. Um, it's more, um, well, philosophical and historical. Uh, but it's experimenting in the sense of having hypotheses and testing them and seeing whether they fit. But the kind of data tend to come more from archives or interviewing people, that kind of thing. I did do experimental work in graduate school where I decided, as a historian, I decided that I should reproduce old experiments so that I could understand what it was that I was writing about. And for my dissertation, I picked one experiment that had been called a crucial experiment, and it was with nerve fiber development. Um, the details don't matter so much, but it had been from 1907 uh, considered a crucial experiment, and I wanted to ask the question, well, what does it mean to talk about a crucial experiment? Did it really decide the question you know, in, at hand? But also, you know, what actually happened in that experiment? So I reproduced it, and I was terrible at reproducing it. I worked with the developmental biologist, and we just had real trouble reproducing it in 1907 terms because they didn't have all these wonderful antiseptics to keep things from growing and all that kind of stuff. But eventually we, we figured out how to make things work, cheated a little with a little modern method <laughs> added in, but... But um, what was really fascinating about all that, I spent a lot of time on that one experiment, reproducing somebody else's. Turns out, in retrospect, that it was the first ever stem cell experiment. It was using neuroblast cells, which are neural stem cells. And it was the first tissue culture experiment. So historically, it was extremely important. And my question, so you should always have a driving question with your research as I torture my students. What's your driving question? Yeah, the, so what was my driving question? Um, it really was, is that a crucial experiment? And the answer was, yes, it was sociologically crucial, meaning it convinced people, but it was not logically crucial, meaning it didn't have to be the case. So, so the results did not lead to the conclusions necessarily but people were persuaded that it did. So that's kind of interesting in science that you can have something that is very persuasive and, and it convinces people of something, but it's not logically that it had to be that way. And that goes to your thinking about, okay, here's the situation and, and, and it's bad and what can I do to address it? You know, there, there are times when you know, maybe maybe if something really isn't logically crucial, it's worth thinking about, well, okay, what are some other options? What am I not thinking about? So this looks like it works, and it's convincing everybody that it works, but what am I not thinking about? And I know there's a lot of discussion in um, right now on sustainability and with the global, uh, well, sustainability goals from of various different sorts, but you know, okay, we think we know a lot and we think we know what we need to do about some things. We just have to persuade people. But, you know, maybe we don't know everything or maybe there are other options that could in fact work better. Maybe if we had stopped looking at water flowing across a particular area and look more systemically, look at, you know, something larger system and talked about, you know, why, you know, instead of a question, where should we put the dam, whether we need a dam, or whether we should do other things, if we step back and look at larger systems, then we might, in fact, make more progress and convince people, rather than continually saying, how can we go persuade people of what we know to be the truth? 
Um, sometimes I feel like if there is something really good and something that's really worth of pursuing, there doesn't have to be like a persuasive um, part of it. So if if it's logically correct, if it makes sense on a large scale, then probably people would feel it, will know it by heart that it's uh, a good thing. So they wouldn't have to be convinced in that. Um, and also with the sustainable development goals, um, I'm not sure about it, but sometimes it feels like uh, the world is rushing a little bit um, into solutions that are not necessarily correct or right to do and sometimes this rush can cost even more uh, to the humanity in general and uh, to to other species as well so mm, and also in, in my experience uh, I was recently just recently realized that it's sometimes it's good to take more time um, to things that you want to pursue because even if it's yes it is more important to like okay get, get comprehensive exams on time but if it's not a good quality preparation, if it's not enough time for you to prepare for it, probably it's not a good thing to make it faster. Probably it's better to slow down to make progress faster in the future. And I feel the same with the, the, the one that you said about sustaining. Which, which sounds great and is obviously true in some sense that we often would be better off to slow down a little bit. But then let me give the rebuttal, like, no, wait, the world is falling, you know, the sky is falling, the world is failing, you know, we're all in a horrible situation, we're going to die, um, we have to do something this minute. So there are times when, and politically right now, in various places in the world, it feels like there are times when it's necessary to do something, and so it's a really interesting, complex question to figure out how to sort through the various somethings that we might do to be sure, to avoid what you're saying, to be sure that we're not rushing ahead and doing something that's going to cause more damage. Are there ways that we can move ahead but do it in some informed way where we've thought about more options first rather than rushing to do a particular thing? And especially... Are there ways when we say, we know this isn't the best possible thing, but we have to do it anyway, are there ways to kind of stop and pause at that point and think, all right, all right, what are our other options? Let's think through all the other options. Hmm. Do you think there were times in the in the human history where we had this kind of urgent uh, need for solutions? Uh, right now it's about climate change. How about the past? Yeah, the past is a long time, and there there's a lot of it, and there are a lot of <laughs> examples. Um, one in my in my lifetime, so I grew up in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where there's Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which was part of the Manhattan Project and part of contributing to atomic bomb. My dad was head of nuclear physics there. Um, and so there was much thinking about nuclear power and the possibility of developing nuclear power but all that discussion was all in the context of nuclear war and who is it who's getting, you know, what countries are getting nuclear weapons? And there was much concern, and I know my dad was involved in actually trips to Russia to work with them on verifying, you know, where actually did they have their nuclear facilities? And, um, and do we really know? Were we telling other countries the truth about our nuclear facilities? Abilities and were they telling us? And there was great fear. There were moments of great fear. You know, we're on the we're on the verge of nuclear war, and there was there were problems um, in the Middle East, as there seem perpetually to be, uh, where it was, oh my God, we're going to have nuclear war any minute. And then other problems were, oh dear, we're on the verge of nuclear war. And then there was a question, all right, how are we going to control it? Okay, what we have to do is stop all nuclear development was what some people said. It's urgent. As with, as with climate change, there's an urgency. We have to stop all nuclear development. Right now, right this minute, we have to get rid of weapons. There were many people who said that. Meanwhile, already Japan, France, and others had developed a lot of nuclear power options. And so they're reliant on that. So you're going to say, oh, we're going to get rid of that? And what, burn more coal? Um, so that, that goes to your point about, okay, we're rushing along but not thinking through ev everything and what its consequences are. So that's an example 
Um, there were other examples in the 1930s, which led in the U.S. to the Depression, but also in other countries to um, yeah, to various problems that led us to World War II eventually. But but there was a lot of poverty. There were um, in the United States the Great Dust Bowl and you know the um, the effects of the climate at the time and the fact that farming practices had been bad led to a lot of people starving and moving around and there was you know desperate desperate desperation around how are we going to feed people and that was true in parts of um, the Soviet Union and parts of the Middle East as well partly because of the climate patterns at the time but also because of farming um, practices I don't know a huge amount about that but there was definitely a feeling of desperation and there was a feeling of scientists oh we have to urgently change our farming practices we have to do this we have to do that without really clarity um, that it was going to work before that 1918 it was World War one there was the um, flu epidemic pandemic flu um, that was killing large number killed far more people than the war did um, and and so questions about all right what is this and how do we stop it and what do we what do we do about it there was a feeling of urgency and desperation but not clarity about how to proceed again I think I think the biggest thing that we have learned to do in the modern world so since the enlightenment the biggest thing we've learned to do is be reductionist you know look smaller and smaller and smaller reduce any problem to smaller and smaller things um, instead of looking at larger systems and the way that parts interact. So when we look at the body, what do we do in medicine? You know, if you have some problem in medicine, you have to go to 14 different specialists or whatever. You know, there, there, you know, there's this guy who looks at bones and the guy who looks at muscles and the person who looks at whatever. Well, they're all connected. So, you know, who is it who's looking at the whole and how it's connected? Same with the, you know, same with the world, nature. You know, how is water? We got people who specialize. I specialize in water. Oh, I'm the person specializing on air. Oh, I look at water temperature. Oh, I look at, yeah. So who is it who's putting it all together? And there are modelers who work on putting variables together, but then what impact does that have? So we need to look at larger larger systems analysis, really. There's a, there's a guy you should talk to, Manfred Laubachler, who is in the um, Global Futures Group, as well as a little bit in School of Life Sciences. And he is the director for the School for Complex Adaptive Systems and really, really working on how can we understand complex systems, complex adaptive, meaning they evolve systems, um, and then what do we gain when we look that way rather than all the little reductionistic bits. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's like um, I heard that there is a huge difference between being complicated and complex because complicated is something that you ha where you have many parts of the system and that's complicated because it's a huge amount of information. But complex instead um, is something that has also, it might not have many parts, but they might interact in such a way that this interaction is really hard to describe. And for example, uh, atmospheric chemistry is really hard to describe, and that's why we still don't know, oh, what's happening with the climate change? How do we solve it? Well, it's just because we have so many gases, um, uh, both in atmosphere and hydrosphere, and well, basically everywhere, biosphere, and uh, they interact depending on their concentrations, depending on temperature, pressure, and everything. So it's uh, really, it really is a complex, yeah, I like that. I like that distinction. One of the things that I work on most is reproductive health, and um, so that relates to issues about abortion, of course, uh, indirectly. But um, you know, what is what is an embryo? What is a fetus? How do they develop? How do we know um, in humans and other organisms? But but there, questions about well, what should we do about abortion policy or whatever, is really really a matter of complexity because you've got so many parts, the social, the individual, the health, the, the mother, woman, the fetus. I mean, you've got so many different 
parts, each of which has some authority and some rights, and yet um, figuring out how they should interact and what the, how the system works together is really what do you think about it? About the when when does embryo starts developing into a child that has a soul or you know something that we can consider a living uh, organism? Because again, with abortion, there is so much debate around this topic. Um, like, is abortion really um, killing a child, or like at what point it becomes so? So when you ask those questions that way. I would like to take you into a classroom, and get the whiteboard, and draw pictures and say, here's how development works. In the beginning, there is an egg. It gets fertilized for humans and other mammals and other a lot of other organisms. But it gets fertilized. The cells start dividing. But in fact, there isn't any gene expression for a while. So do we want to call that? You know, what do we want to call that? And you just use the word soul. Um, okay, leave that out of it. I mean, that's not a, well, okay, that's not a biological question. So you can bring back in ideas about soul, but you have to define them. You have to explain what they mean. You have to be sure that other people you're talking to are thinking the same thing. Somebody once said soul is a word where if you have a whole bunch of people in a room and you say, okay, okay, think about soul. Now write down keywords that you think are important. You have so many different answers um, because I think a lot of people don't even know what they mean. I mean, or they mean multiple things by by that. And so, yeah, it's a huge, huge, important question. What is that developing thing, and how should we think about it? Um, and there are lots of different pieces that we need to put together to understand it. I want to make one point that I think is kind of important here. When the um, in the United States, when the Dobbs ruling came about um, about abortion with the Supreme Court, I got calls from a number of people, but from two people who really stood out. One was with the Los Angeles Times, and one was um, a freelancer. But they they were people who were doing science and medical journalism. They were covering science and medical stories. And both of these people had no idea about the science. And so that raises questions about where should you get information. But for them, abortion, issues related to abortion, issues related to reproduction, somehow didn't depend on knowing about scientifically what's going on. And one of them was really confused when I said that that contraception is not the same as abortion. And she said, well, OK, but they're both the same kind of thing, aren't they? I said, no, abortion, by definition, is the ending of or the termination either natural or whatever, but the termination of a pregnancy. Contraception is before conception. You don't have any pregnancy. They're totally different. And her response was, oh, my God, oh, my God, I never, I never understood that. I, she thought that when some legislators, and there are some in Mississippi and Arkansas and places, some legislators were trying to outlaw contraception, on the grounds that it was a form of abortion, she thought that made sense. And it's just she didn't, I could say she was ignorant in the sense that she didn't understand the science. But what's shocking, what was shocking to me is that she didn't ever think that it was important to understand the science about what was going on. She was great. And actually, we talked a long time. And I sent her references afterwards, and she followed up, and she really read them, and she really thought about them, and I thought, yay, okay, get people to think one mind at a time, <laughs> if that's what it takes. But I think um, it's true with a lot of the sustainability kinds of questions as well, that a lot of people think what matters is we have to get enough water to enough people, or we have to whatever, and not really 
realizing how important it is to think more systematically or systemically about the science that's involved with that. And if you're going to get water to more people, in some cases, you can't just say, I'm going to get more water because the water may be contaminated by, you know, heavy, heavy metals, for example, in some cases, or it may be contaminated by way too much nitrogen in some cases. So it's not just water. You have to think about what it is that you're actually producing. So that's a long speech about multiple topics all mixed up together. Yeah, that's a very good example of like when you talk to the person who is like into something like really deeply, like like you into biology, like you, you have to really like know what to say. You can't just like throw words because for like people who know everything about this topic, those words are like crucial. They know like anything, like any small detail about like any word. And for people who don't know, it's just like, some words that mean somewhat similar things. So that's why I'm like, I sometimes, I need to like watch out what I say to some people because it may, it may seem to them that you like don't know just anything and there is no point to talk to you. It's really important to define terms and understand what they mean, like soul or whatever. But that doesn't mean there's one definition that the teacher you know, tells everybody and they all write it down and memorize it. Um, it means that we need sometimes to negotiate a definition. What do we mean by enough of whatever? Or what do we mean by sustainable? Yeah, <laughs> just to go to a messy topic. Yeah, it's a very convoluted term. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, so maybe um, one thing that we really need and that universities help provide is, and that you're helping provide, is really getting people to talk to each other and kind of start to peel back some of the un, you know the assumptions that underlie their work like why okay you think that why do you think that you know what what is it that's causing you to think that and have you thought about this other thing that might in fact change your mind etc Um, I'm really curious about the topic of um, ethics in uh, biomedical research and biomedical practices. So I, last year I was really obsessed with the research of lobotomy, of how um, doctors uh, in the past century were treating um, diseases such as alcoholism, such as uh, depression and like mental disorders with these needles that go into the, your brain uh, to basically uh, fix uh, physically some things. And what interesting was to me uh, um, is that it seems that lobotomy is very, is not ethical at all. But back in time, um, there were so many research, there were so many books. Uh, for example, Michigan State University, they published a huge um, paper, huge, actually it was a book about lobotomy and they were proving that this is um, working, this is a good practice. And I was shocked that um, maybe 30, 40 years ago, lobotomy was suspended everywhere in the world, and U.S. was one of the um, countries that stopped it very like lately. In I think it was uh, 80s, 90s, around that time. So I'm surprised. How is that possible that something horrible that happens, uh, like in in medicine, uh, happens for a while, and people pray for it, pe people think it's good. And yet only after they realize that's not actually working, that's not actually helping, our understanding was wrong. How does that happen? That's a great question. Let me ask you back. So in that case, what did they count as evidence? So you said that they people said it was working. Yes. What evidence did they give that it was working? The behavior of these people changed, and I think they misunderstood the signals, um, you know, after they treated. So you have control group, you have treated group, and the treated group seemed to behave better, seemed to lose this, you know, attention, you know, attention to alcohol, and they seemed to be happier um, compared to when they had depression. Um, but to me, it was like false signals because afterwards they started developing other diseases, like, um, um, earlier stages of autism, something like that, be just because uh, their parts of brains were modified. 
but how does it, how is it possible that scientists who study these topics their entire life misunderstand this? How is that? How is it possible? Yeah, great. I think you just answered your own question. Then. <laughs> how is it? Which is why, I, which I, is why I pushed back to what did they offer as evidence? I think they were so convinced that um, that in fact it was working because they'd set up that here's a bad situation. Oh, no, oh, no, we have to do something. We have to help these people. <coughs> Sorry. We have to help these people do something. And, oh, here's an experiment. Now we've tried this lobotomy. Oh, it works. Look, it's a miracle. It works. Or not really a miracle, but, you know, it works. It's great. Look how it's working. Look at how, how a great job that it's doing. And they become convinced that that's the case. And so you can ask, how could that be? Well, it was rational at the time that they saw something working in a way that they had defined as working. It failed to be reasonable when there was counter evidence or when people started to say, to ask the question you're asking, you know, sorry that you're pointing to and saying, wait a minute, what do we mean by working? Maybe it's doing something, but it's, you know, the whack-a-mole thing, like, okay, we got rid of depression, but oops, we've popped up something worse. Um, and, and so, and so um, there are lots of examples uh, historically where, and currently, but um, there are lots of examples where somebody really wants to accomplish something, and it's for good impulse. It's not that they're bad people or they want to do bad things. They want to help people. And they try something, and what counts as evidence, or what they count as evidence, is such that it allows them to believe that they've been successful. And it's only when people challenge that evidence, the nature of that evidence, that it starts to be questionable, and then it takes additional study to figure out that that was wrong. So one of the examples I like to point to when I when I used to teach history of medicine is this guy, Benjamin Rush. And it was in the United States, 1793, in Philadelphia, which was, which was then the capital of the country. It wasn't Washington, D.C. yet. That happened soon. But so, so Philadelphia is the capital of the country, the capital of the state, and then it has its own government. Yellow fever came. Yellow fever started coming. It wasn't clear why, but, but at first. But Here's this disease, and it starts coming, and people start dying. In the end, in the, and within a month and a half, 5,000 people more died in Philadelphia. People dropping dead on the street. So kind of like COVID with, you know, on steroids, as they say. But And everybody who was rich and could leave the city did. And interesting, the, nobody who got out of the city got sick. But in the city, they were getting sick. They figured, oh, it's something in the environment. We don't know what it is. Eventually it was sorted out. There was mosquitoes, but that took a long time. But there was this guy, Benjamin Rush. Benjamin Rush was a doctor. Benjamin Rush said, I am a doctor. I believe in, he kind of got a savior complex a little bit, but I believe in my abilities to help people. It is my responsibility to help people. A lot of doctors left town, but no, Benjamin Rush stayed. And he said, I have to take heroic control over this situation. I have to help these people. Clearly, they have fever. Therefore, I need to, what they did at the time was bleed them because it was thought, oh, you get a fever when you have too much blood because the blood is hot and the blood is giving you too much heat. So you let out blood, and then that will help with fever. So he said, I got to let blood. And then he said, and there's something bad going on inside, so I need to treat with mercury. So he had people drinking mercury, and it wrecked his insides. Okay, so why, why am I telling this story? Because he became absolutely convinced that his heroic approach was helping people. He had many anecdotes. Look, it's working. People are getting better. Now, partly people are getting better because somebody was taking care of them and giving them water and food rather than leaving them abandoned in their homes to die. But, you know, so he said, he said, this heroic approach is right. It's what we need. We have to do it. We have to do it. We have to do it. And other people need to help me. And, you know, he just became almost fanatic. And he was working all day and all night. And he had a bunch of people doing it. He barely rested. 
you know, he really was a hero in his mind, but really truly was a hero in trying to help and seeming to help. It was working. Until some doctors who were trained in the French tradition said, let's do autopsies of some of those people who are dying who have been treated in that way. And when they did autopsies, they discovered that the entire insides were totally wrecked. The mercury just destroyed a lot of the organs. So, yeah, so, so people, yes, people were living somewhat, but then eventually, you know, shortly after, a few weeks later, whatever, dying. All right, so was Benjamin Rush a hero? Yes. Was he a good doctor? Yes, in a way, in that he was following his evidence and the anecdotes of people until the evidence shifted, until there was a new kind of evidence from autopsies that showed, wait, he's actually hurting people. There are other ways that we can use. So it goes back to your, your case. I mean, sorry, long story to show parallel, but you know, that often people become very caught up in what they're doing, very convinced that it's working, um, and it's when other kinds of evidence come in that start to challenge that and say, wait a minute, it's working to do what? So in the case with lobotomies, wait, you know, but what else is it causing? And what happens to the people 10 years later and things like that started to raise questions. Like with eugenics, it was, oh, eugenics is a great thing. You know, they're bad, they're bad people who are imbeciles, et cetera, et cetera. We have to stop them from breeding, breeding. let's sterilize them. Oh, look, this is helping the population. And briefly, in some contexts, that looked like it was working. But then stepping back, looking at the broader picture, wait a minute, why are they targeting largely black, poor people, et cetera, et cetera? Hmm, maybe we need to think about this a little bit more. Maybe there are other things we could be doing. Anyway, nature of the evidence, the, the coming together of different types of evidence is really important in science, in technology, and in our applications of science and technology to solve world problems. So we need to bring evidence about different kinds of people as well. Maybe something works for one population, but not another. And we really need to think about that. Maybe something that works for rich white people in some country, rich countries, um, will not be the same thing that's going to work in a poor you know, in a poor brown country or whatever. Mm -hmm. But how about the verification process? So if, for example, we want to develop a vaccine, we have to test it so many times, so many years um, have to have to go through, and uh, only then we can start giving it to people. But why was the case, you know, back in lobotomy with this uh, yellow fever that it was not, you know, that they started testing it on people? How is that? Well, we do ex we do testing on people with experimental surgery, for example. So a lot of times the surgeon will I shouldn't say a lot of times I don't I don't that's not I don't know a number it's like not like point three eight something yeah but but um, but there are times when uh, you know somebody especially in battlefields or uh, even with cancer and other kinds of things that do kind of real devastating really devastating things to the body. A surgeon can go in and say, "Okay, here's what I'm going to do." Oh wait, yikes! Okay, I've got to, I've got to shift and do something else here because I'm not going to solve the problem. I have to experiment because we don't have enough cases to know what's going to happen in this particular case. So they're, so they're experimenting with humans because the choice is doing nothing and knowing the person is going to die or suffer or whatever or trying something. Now some of those. Some surgeons get a little surgically happy or whatever and maybe do things or try things that they shouldn't. Um, <clears throat> maybe with lobotomies or certainly with lobotomies, some people cut out more than they should or more different people than they should. But the attempt to do something, it goes back to your earlier comments about rushing ahead. It, the attempt to do something is an impulse that people have. There's a problem. We have to do something. Let's do it quickly. And it's based on limited evidence necessarily. And if all we did was sit around waiting for all the evidence to accumulate, we'd never do anything. And we probably wouldn't be here now. 
but we won't be here long. <laughs> um, so sometimes it's necessary to, to move ahead based on limited evidence, but it's really important to think about why we're making the kinds of decisions we're making, how we're making those decisions, even when we're faced with uncertainty or limited knowledge. How can we sort through um, decisions and then not say, oh, we've decided, let's go all do it now. Let's be open to change. So mRNA vaccines seem to be wonderful for COVID. You know, they seem to be very effective and in, um, in, in many, many ways, but let's not just stop as one of the, one of the winners of the Nobel Prize recently for the mRNA work, as she said, let's not just stop and think we have the answers. You know, we've got to keep experimenting. We've got to find out whether maybe there are different populations that are affected differently. Maybe there are different kinds of other things we can do that would make vaccines work differently. And different people and for different conditions and things like that. So we can't just stop and say, okay, our knowledge, like Benjamin Rush, you know, you can't be Benjamin Rush and say, okay, I know it all. I'm stopping now. I don't want to learn anything new. We've got to keep asking. I should have asked it earlier, but what is lobotomy? <laughs> like for me, it's something that like, uh, yeah, what does it sound like? It sounds like that professional doctors or professional biologists uh, doctors. doctors use someone's brain in order to find new things, in order to like investigate what's going to happen if this and this happens. No, kind of, but not exactly. Yeah, that's why I want to, 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 to like them. make make sure. <laughs> if if I could only explain it in a kind of my very simple understanding, it's like we have a person sitting on um, on a chair, for example. And then uh, a doctor has this very long um, syringe or how it's called a uh, needle. Um, then they insert it through your um, like the eyelid, uh, going through the yeah, go to your brain directly through the core. There are two types of it, I think. Uh, one of that, one is that, and another one is when they cut part of your um, what it's called. Mm -hmm. Uh, skin and um, skull, uh, and directly s you can see the brain. And because it was back in time, they didn't have really good anest um, anesthetics. Um, it was either morphine. They did, yeah. They had some anesthetics, but not yeah, but not super uh, super titrated like yeah. now. Yeah. So Sometimes people were even um, um, like conscious when the operation was going they were even had um they had uh their eyes moving around when the operation ha was happening and it was the treatment against alcoholism against depression against men mental disorders in general and it was targeting only this part of brain because it was um what is it responsible for for like i, I could have said so okay, that, but that's a good explanation but. for me <laughs> Well, so I think the important point is that people at the time were actually, they're drawing pictures of the brain and what what area corresponds to what. So they were deciding this part corresponds to certain kinds of behavior, back here is a different kind of, you know, and they were making these maps of the brain, um, which were based on very limited evidence, but it was decided that the prefrontal um, lobotomy in particular, so the prefrontal, the, the, the very front of the, of the brain um, was a part that was causing depression and some, I think even schizophrenia, but a number of things. And, um, and, that, and that people were really suffering from these conditions and we didn't have nice drugs to give them or whatever. And so um, there were people who were really just in in very upsetting conditions, and basically the only cure, the only treatment, was to lock them up in a mental asylum and let them bash their heads against the wall or whatever. I mean, it was really quite grim, and so it seemed like here's this wonderful medical, um, medical and you know scientifically driven approach where you can correlate a certain part of the brain with a certain problem and cure it. It looked like a great idea. 
And there were people who anecdotally themselves reported, oh my God, I haven't felt that great for decades or whatever. Um, but then the, and, and, and in fact, it did relieve a lot of suffering for people who had been having constant pain or multiple schizophrenia or kind of mul multiple, dis multiple personality disorders of certain sorts. It did make them feel less desperate. But it also wiped out a lot of other things and affected them in a lot of other ways, which is where the other where the other evidence comes in that they start to realize, oh wait, that did things that we hadn't anticipated. So talking about the brain, uh, like, is it true that we, like, we as humanity, we still are not sure how like our brain works? Because <laughs> like, because like, if we think about it, like we. We're doing like so much thing as like humanity. We like we go to space, we go to the bottom of the ocean, we have this like accelerator of particles, which is like like innovations, but we still don't know how like our own brain works. Like we kinda don't know. I mean, we know a lot about how you know what kinds of nerve cells are up there and how they connect together. It's just there are a lot of things we don't know, or I think your example with lobotomy really points out there are a lot of things that some people think they know, but we don't really know as much as we think. Um, you, you, should, you should talk on this topic. You should absolutely talk to my colleague, Jason Robert. He um, is a bioethicist, but uh, also has taught in the law school and taught neuroscience in the law. And what's fascinating there is looking at how a lot of things that people have claimed that we know about what's going on in the brain with certain, especially brain imaging, um, has been introduced into the courts and used, you know, here's imaging that shows this person has a you know, pathological, like psychotic or whatever behavior kind of thing. You know, that, that's an extreme, but, you know, has been used in the courts and that's highly problematic in so many different ways. But there's so many things about neural imaging that have been used to discover lots of interactions, but also to raise a lot of ethical and, and, and practical questions. Yeah, Jason Robert is a great guy you should talk to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, I wanted to ask you about the um, back to kind of surgeries and medical practices. Um, my sister, she's a doctor. Uh, she is becoming a doctor uh, in medicine. And so uh, one thing that she recently told me, and I was, I st I'm still processing this information, um, is that as a practice for, as a student practice, you need to go to, um, I don't know how it's called, but you perform certain operations, certain surgeries on dead bodies after accidents or after they just um, either naturally died or somehow uh, in the other way. Mm, and then you gotta do some tissue operations, um, you gotta explore the dead body, what's happening in there. And I just remember a couple of years ago, she was telling me that there is no way I'm doing this. It's so unethical, I'm not, you know, touching, you know, someone else's body that just got dead because it still might have, again, soul in it. And how do I, how do I overcome this? How do I start doing this? And uh, once I was talking to her, I started, I started also realize that it depends on basically time because three years later, she's doing these operations and I, I was asking, I, I was asking her, how do you do it? You were saying that no way in the world you're doing this. And she's like, yeah, I can do it. Why not? It's like a practice. I'm becoming better at it. And I just discovered that it's, it's such a huge change in perception of like living organisms. So how does the, did you have this like Eureka moment in your life? Where, where is she? Russia. Okay. Does that show that like there, there are, we don't have like good, like ex experimental things for the future doctors in Russia? Cause we like, well, we don't have like needed technologies in order to like do surgeries. That's why they practice on dead bodies. Or no, or they still do it here in America. They do the same. Or so let's be. So I said before we need to define our terms and be sure what we're talking <laughs> about. Practice on. Um, you can't practice medicine on a dead body because it's. I mean, practicing medicine is 
working on a live body by definition, but but it it is it is absolutely traditional to do autopsies to do dissections. Those are two different things, but absolutely traditional in pretty much all countries. But there are also a lot of um, virtual opportunities as well. Now let me ask you. So we'll come back. There are many different layers to peel back on that particular case. If you needed to have neurosurgery, um, you know, something, let's say you have an injury, you would, that guy ran into you at you know, your accident, and then you had, you were smashed up, and your brain was hurt, and then you needed to have neurosurgery. Do you want to have a neurosurgeon who has never looked at an actual body and has only looked at a computer to try to figure out what's going on? I want somebody who's looked at the stuff because inside there, it's not neat little, it's not a puzzle. It's not like the pieces are all neatly put in. They're, they're things all intertwine and they're not all the same in every person and the way that the um, nerve fibers you know, connect is, is, is different. So I want people who have studied an actual body. Okay. So in the United States, so different countries have different policies. China might be one of the worst that we know of, but I don't, and I don't know about Russia, but I'm going to assume that Russia is a civilized country and has, has ethical standards that they apply to their medical training. And what happens is people, including my parents, donate their bodies to be studied in medical schools. And so it is done with consent, and it is not, you know, oh, I'm going to experiment or do these bad things on somebody who doesn't, who doesn't, um, you know, who doesn't want me to. It's done with consent, and it's typically done by people who think if there was a soul, it's not there anymore. Um, you know, the standard Catholic and many Christian views is, okay, at death, poof, you know, there goes the soul. Um, and it, uh, but for whatever reason. Yeah, you know, they've donated their bodies. The point of dissection, so that's the learning process and taking a body and dissecting it apart um, to, to see how it works. The process of doing dissection is in order to see what's inside and understand it if you're a medical student. It's done in the United States with respect, with care. Um, and here I keep giving you a... a giving you people you should talk to you should really talk to Rebecca Fisher she's amazing she's wonderful um, right now she is at the U of A medical school she does research at ASU but she's at the U of A medical school in charge of their um, their teaching anatomy and physiology she's in charge of that department and she's also a real practitioner in this sense. so she's teaching people how to cut up these bodies and understand them but she's also teaching them about the importance of whenever they um, first meet the donor, so they call it not a body, but they call it a donor. So as you know, that not not that it's a person anymore, but it was a whole. We talked before about whole systems. You know, it was a whole interacting person at a point, and still is a whole body. So they meet their donors, and um, they have. A ceremony, but also reflection on what it means to to have the privilege to study somebody who has donated their body. I mean, think about that. People have donated in order for people to learn, and so the respect for that uh, ability to to learn is very important. So there's a process of thinking about what you're doing when you're doing a dissection. That's very important. I don't know what the traditions are in Russia. I know there are other countries where there is not that sort of tradition. It's just like, okay, here's your body, go chop it up, kind of thing. Um, again, let's assume that in Russia it's a civilized approach and they understand the issues, which is what caused your hurt. sister to come and understand what was going on. So that's dissection, where you're taking the donated body and, and studying it. There are also autopsies, and pathologists have to do autopsies, or they do autopsies. Um, autopsies are done on people who have died 
They can be done with consent. They sometimes have to be done for forensic reasons. So let's say somebody has died and we don't know how they died and there's a suspicion that they've been drugged or that you know something has been done to them. And so in order to prosecute the crime or find out what the crime is, like if you watch murder mysteries on TV or whatever, yeah, you know, there's always somebody doing autopsies and and you know looking at what what's happened to the person. And so the autopsy is in order to discover something like that or so that's a that's a forensic, you know, crime oriented reason or with some diseases. Uh we want to know what's going on inside. So we know what symptoms are, but what's happening inside? And with the 1918 flu epidemic, this is where history is great because it gives you all these fun examples. 1918 flu epidemic, there were some people who, there were some autopsies done at the time, but not a lot in the, and that wasn't as advanced, the technology wasn't advanced. But there have been some bodies found that were, as, as climate change is good here, in that um, it's melting permafrost. And there's some bodies that have been found from that era. And so there have been some autopsies very carefully done. And what it really is showing, the 1918 flu epidemic was terribly, terribly um, virulent, but also very, uh, it, it killed a lot of people. I forgot what the word for that is. But it killed a lot of people because it was a virus that was invading in the normal, like, Old or coronavirus type way, but it then infected the lungs in a way that brought pneumonia very quickly and other lung problems. So it was a and and bacterial infections were occurred very rapidly. So it's a combination of a virus and a bacterium interacting in the body in certain ways that caused the devastation of that disease. So those autopsies reveal that, which then carry us to today. So when we look at COVID and how people are reacting, are there those kinds of complicated, going back to your complicated, complicated with many parts, um, disease, disease reactions going on? And the answer is for most people, probably not. But for some of the early deaths before we knew very much, probably so because we weren't treating with antivirals and we weren't treating with antibiotics quickly because nobody knew what to do. Um, so autopsies teach us a lot. I wanted to ask you about um, these diseases that are, uh, well, not diseases, viruses that are going from, um, that are caused by melting of ice, for example, or of permafrost. Um, I'm a huge fan of science fiction uh, books. And um, there was a book, it's called Ice. I forgot the author, but he's an American. Um, and he was writing about um, North Pole and that, um, well, millions of times, m millions of years ago, there were organisms that were habitating uh, this environment and the climatic conditions were different. And based on this, well, humans wouldn't be able to live in that con in these conditions. Um, and so after the ice age uh, has come, uh, these viruses, these organisms, this basically living environment just got frozen up. Um, and then after um, other hundreds, mil hundreds, thousands of years, um, because of the climate change, these uh, permafrost uh, and also ice masses started melting. And then there were Soviet and American scientists who were trying to discover uh, North Pole. And so they found these blocks of ice, these blocks of so frozen soil. Um, and they started uh, just basically taking it apart, um, you know, just basically researching what's inside of it. And then turns out that there was a very um, dangerous virus that because it started melting, it just spread out everywhere. And these scientists just basically died. And there is a huge base of equipment that just, you know, buried in the North Pole, um, like both equipment and people who were trying to study um, this environment just died because of this virus because they uh, didn't know about that. And they basically just 
um, kind of it was able to escape because of their research. Do you think it is possible nowadays with the uh, melting ice and permafrost in in our world? Yes. Yeah, so I'm not such a fan of science fiction, <laughs> and uh, because it drives me crazy sometimes. But but no. But that that's a that's a great example. And actually. Um, Right now, there are scientists who are who are studying the melting permafrost and and also um, ice core samples that they're that they've taken from Antarctica and from the North Pole as well, and and there is there is real concern about what kinds of not just not viruses only but what kinds of microbes what kinds of microbial communities there are. Um, there because clearly there are some um, and they're discovering. So we don't have a very good uh, census of all the microbes that exist in the world, frankly. And so we don't know what's normal. And so it's very hard to say, oh, here's a new one we've never seen before. You can't just look at a list and see that it you know, hasn't been found before. But, um, but as some of the permafrost is melting, grasses are exposed and Microbial communities, all, all soil tends to have a lot of microbes in it because they're helping the soil grow things. Um, they're they're finding you know combinations of various microbes that are not familiar to us, and so you know are there also potentially pathogens there? Yes, almost surely. Um, there may be things that are pathogens not for humans but for other other things, um, but there also may be things, microbes, I mean, we read a lot about the advantage of the right micro, good microbes in our gut and good microbiome. There may be some things that, that are there that are advantageous for some communities as well, um, and potentially as things thaw that having the microbes there as well are helpful. So we could have a, I, one reason that I don't like science fiction is it always seems to come out bad badly, you know, that the things are bad, but there could be good. I mean, there could be really opportunistic, interesting things that come out as well. So, but yes, it's real. I mean, it, there, there, there's some things actually that people are studying. The mummy that was found in Switzerland, mummified um, climber who was found in Switzerland, and there are people who are studying what the microbes are there and trying to figure out how many of them were added later by people touching the thing or you know, by exposure to air and how many are actually you know, were, were part of the individual at the time and how things have changed, looking at um, changes. There are various efforts to take any kind of mummies that exist around the world and look at what we can discover about what the gut um, might have had at the time and the things aren't still living, but you know, their DNA sequencing, barcoding, that kind of stuff that's going on to look at communities that sounds science fictiony, but you know, there are people working on you know what can we learn, and it goes to again where we started that that it goes to trying to understand complex systems and what are the different parts of complex systems that we often overlook but really need to pay attention to the microbes as well as the things like us. Yeah, um, I was actually surprised by the fact that we study biology, chemistry, and physics for such a long time, uh, and microbes seem to be very simple kind of organisms that we can study and look at, yet at the same time, after all this time, we don't know all of them, and how much do you think, How what share of uh, these microbes do we know? 5%? 20%? I don't, I, the people who are experts in that field say, we have no idea. We keep finding, as people are doing explorations in deep sea, you talked before about people going down in the sea, and, you know, as people are looking in the deep sea, they're finding you know, microbial communities that are different. So they're individual microbes, but they don't usually wander around on their own. I mean, they can, like from, you know, temporarily, but they tend to come together in communities. And so there can be different ways that different microbes come together. And so that's why the microbiome in the gut is the discussion, not what microbes, what's the list of things you have there, but what's the complex combination of them. Um, so, so who knows? Um, 
uh, there are lots of bugs that we don't know either. I mean, it's a clear that there are lots of insects that we that we don't know about, and there are probably lots of deep sea marine organisms, really tiny things that we don't that we don't know about as well. But we especially don't know much about microbial communities. And there are people, I, I work in the summer at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and there are people there who work on molecular evolution and work on microbial communities and are doing some of the really first-rate work looking at what we do know and what we don't know and how we can know more and what we need and order, what evidence do we need in order to start to understand what's going on and a recognition that we got to pay a lot more attention to microbes. I mean, they make up a lot of us, so it would be really useful to know who they are. It's like atoms making up everything in this universe, and microbes are making up everything Right, else. everything growing out there, us, yeah, we're all t lots of microbes. There is this phrase, the more you study something, the more <laughs> you realize that you don't know anything. Yep. Yeah. That's a great, <laughs> yeah, that's a great phrase. That's kind of the whole guiding the whole guiding principle for science, right? I mean, okay, you learn new things and you then discover that you gotta learn a lot more new things. And so figuring out more efficient ways to learn is something with modeling and use of computational approaches, learning how, how things fit together in systems is something that will be helpful. I think, and maybe it's a place to start wrapping up, but um, with ASU, is now developing a new medical school. I'm sure you've heard that. And very engineering-oriented medical school is the idea. So students will actually get, the ideal is to get a master's in engineering of some sort as well as their medical degree. And the idea really is to emphasize that we have complex systems that are made up of parts, but they work as wholes in the way that they in, the parts interact and work together. What is the nature of this system? What happens when it's injured? Um, does it kind of recover and regenerate is a word that, that we're using, but you know, or does it fail? And what, what, what tips it to be successful and able to recover or to fail when it's affected by cancer or, uh, or virus or whatever? Okay, just a couple of quick questions before we wrap this up. Uh, if you were to choose one thing, what would you choose? Movies or books? Books. Okay. I have one question about um, what's your, uh, what are you most passionate about in your uh, work that you're doing right now? I don't know the answer to that. I, would I, so, so there was a time when I first was getting a job when I could have come to ASU or go to an Ivy League school. I had two offers for a tenure track job. Everybody approximately in the universe told me I was an idiot not to go to the tenure track school, but in, in the Ivy League school. But I wanted to come to ASU because I saw, I felt like I could make a difference, and I saw that there were a whole bunch of students who didn't feel entitled to things. They weren't rich kids. They felt like, oh, I want to learn. And I love teaching, and I love working with those students, and I love helping students learn how to become themselves. And what I love about ASU is that I can work with students and help them learn to write and think and communicate and do things that are not standard. So it doesn't, it's not just check off all the boxes and do everything the normal way. They can be themselves and discover who they are and then go in the world and help make it better. And I love that. And that's really what I want to keep doing and what I want to inspire all them to do. This is really insp inspiring. The last question is, what is your quote of the day? Or what is your favorite quote? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't think that way. I don't, yeah. I can tell mine. Um, it actually goes back to what you said before. Uh, it's very short. The more you know, the less you know. So it's basically the same thing about the more you study, the more you realize you don't know anything. I like that, but I don't have a favorite. That's okay. I don't have either. You know what's <laughs> funny is people always say, what's your favorite book? What's your favorite color? What's your favorite whatever? But it goes back to my wanting to have everybody discover who they are and what they love and kind of there's a diversity of things. And so I don't have, I don't tend to have favorites. 
How can you pick one? <laughs> yeah, how can I pick one? Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you very much for okay. your time yeah. and thank you very much listeners and people who watch us. <laughs>